welcome to the Dialogue Out Loud podcast. Uh, I'm Jennifer Quist from the Fiction Department, and with me tonight is one of the uh, recent contributors of a piece of short fiction. This is John Banyan. Uh, John Banyan has published a collection of short fiction, Reading Leah and Other Stories, way back in 1991. Uh, and also five novels. Uh, he seems to be a little bit more productive since retiring as a creative writing um, teacher at the English department at Brigham Young University. Is that fair to say, John? Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, we're all looking forward to that. Congratulations. And welcome to the podcast. We're here today to talk about your short story called By the Numbers. Um, can you give everyone just a, a quick recap of that that story? Um, it's it's something else. It's a uh, it's a speculative work, and 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 definitely needs some some explaining. So go ahead. Okay. Um, well, the the story is uh, about a, a a man who is in in an alternate universe. His name is Isa. And he is at the beginning of the story. He's watching his um, son's wife uh, try to deliver a baby. The woman has preeclampsia, and so there's a lot of trouble. In this universe, um, they have discovered a way to do work with their brain, and so he is. Uh, his title is. Um, uh, projection numerologist, and so he, he projection numerologists uh, run the numbers on an event uh, using their uh, part of their brain and and judge probabilities of whether something's going to happen or not. And so there's a projection numerologist in the operating room judging uh, the young woman Vidi's. Um, help. And then there are other doctors who are using their brains to um, enhance her blood vessels and try to save her from this happening. And um, they make it through, and the child is is uh, delivered cesarean and uh, is alive. And that's the beginning of the story. And various things happen, and um, he has to face uh, a previous event where his own child was uh, born, stillborn, not live-born like this one is, but it was stillborn, and he's sorrowing over that. So it's a, a going back and forth between his this first birth and his new this new birth from not from his wife but from his son's wife. Mm -hmm. His grandchild. He's a little, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's a really interesting world here, and and quite intricately um, considered and put together. Is this part of a larger work that is in progress? Because it just seems like there's too much going on to just leave it at something this length. Well, I when I first conceived it, I thought it was um, a novel, and then I I wrote through her a while, and then it was finished. Or I thought it was, you know. So, so it was a complex and well-developed world. I could go back to it if I chose, but but uh, the story felt finished to me after uh, twenty pages or so, mm -hmm. and so I stopped <laughs> and didn't turn it into a novel. Well, retirement's going to be a long time. Let's hope. Yeah. Right. Let's see what happens because uh, it's it's quite engaging, um, and the. When you say it's an alternate universe, it really feels like an alternate universe, like something that is really similar to things we've known, and just the small changes in it have somehow yielded this completely different way of doing science and medicine and and childbirth. Um, like uh, you've changed uh, Einstein from a he to a she in the story. You changed uh, the 1812 overture to the 1814 overture and all these like little touches um, that, and you even talk about, you know, the butterfly theory kind of uh, idea of changes in, in history. And then it's, it's, it's actually happening in a way that's 
that subtle and and I won't say believable, but that is like good speculative fiction. It's well oh, satisfying, satisfying if if not you know strictly believable. Um, where does this come from? Like you're a humanities uh, teacher and scholar. Uh, what's your connection to the science world? Did you do a lot of research to to come yeah. up with? This? I, I did quite a bit of research. I'm interested. I, I've been interested for a long time in the ideas of Spinoza. I haven't read a lot of Spinoza, and so my I'm very much an amateur at that. But the idea that God uh, thought the universe and brought it into being, mm-hmm. you know, that um, that's that's an idea that's interesting to me, and I think there's a parallel between that and a fiction writer creating a, a world. And so in uh, not my most recent novel, but the previous one called, called Spin, there's a young woman who has to escape her ex-husband with her child. She kidnaps her own child, and she thinks she's trying to she's saving the child. And she knows she can't outsmart him or outspend him or out anything him. And so she starts using a device to make random decisions. And I'm quite interested in that node where um, you decide this and a whole universe opens up. Or you decide that and a whole other universe opens up. And, And I... I I know that a lot of times we as Mormons are taught about the straight and narrow path. And I think that that metaphor has spread too too wide. I mean, it's a good metaphor, you know, being on the straight and narrow path, going through the ordinances and going on, but it's a bad model for trying to make decisions that are, have, have more to do with life than whether I do an ordinance or not, you know, and, and so there's, there's all these, this universe of possibilities. And so I'm interested in fiction that stresses this idea that there are, you're not just facing two choices, you're chasing, uh, facing a multitude of choices at, at every moment. You know, uh, I sat here instead of in the other room and, uh, and, so now I don't have books behind my head. And so, you know, little choices seem to put you on a path. And, and I'm very interested in that that node right at the core where there's either two branches or three or 10 or 20 or however many. And that, that node feels to me interesting in terms of fiction and in terms of life. And it has this has to do with this idea of that whatever you think and decide, that transforms the universe. Talking about decisions here, I wanted to ask you, because I can't quite remember anymore. Uh, Did this story, did you launch it into the world before or after Roe versus Wade was overturned? Uh, Before. No, I thought so. Yeah, interesting, because that has certainly opened up a whole different future for the United States than you were considering when you were writing this story about balancing maternal and uh, infant health and how I did. And um, it's I... really interesting to read it again because, um, you know, you and I have had this in the works for a long time to read it again after never considering it that way before. And I was, yeah, I'm Canadian, so I thought maybe I just wasn't paying attention. But does it read differently to you now in light of that? Or have you ever put those together? I don't know no that it. I don't know that it reads differently to me now because I've ever um, questioned the idea that women should have the choice of their own body, you know, that, that over, over their bodies, that, that um, it, uh, it's such a difficult decision to make a medically, make a medical decision that you need to not have this child. And it's so fraught and dangerous and frightening that to have the government involved with it just seems preposterous to me and always has, you know, and um, that the story 
doesn't feel different me, to me because I wrote it with that ethic before Roe versus Wade, and I still have that ethic. And so um, I don't know that the story has changed that much, really. But 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 the implications of it, as you as you correctly point out, are uh, interesting to think about in this new world where women less and less have the choice to make an ind- a choice independent of government, mm-hmm. which is yeah. so ironic. <laughs> well, the, the, what was making me think of it is um, the woman, when she's struggling through this, this birth that opens the story, she's surrounded by professionals whose job, it seems to me, is to, they're called the projection numerologists, right? The PNs. Yeah. And their job is to know what's going to happen and to weigh probabilities. I assume there's some kind of not just psychological process, but there's actually mathematics going on here, the way you read it. Right. And it requires knowledge and skill. And, and the fact that they're all there calling the timing and the shots of the medical interventions, um, you know, that is kind of how we interact with the medical system. I don't tell my doctor what to do when he's treating me, but it like it made me wonder, since this, the story is all about choice, is there less choice in this alternative universe because there are the projection numerologists, or does this just allow them to make better choices because they have a better prognostication at their disposal? I mean can't answer these it's by um what do you think well i think that um gene england got into some trouble for for creating for proposing the idea that if there's true agency in the universe then maybe god doesn't always know what's going to happen and that drove bruce mcconkey and others kind of crazy and so he uh, that that seems a seems a correct idea to me that the the more you know uh, that that no one can know absolutely what's going to happen is what I'm trying to say that that uh, there's even with these projection numerologists maybe the margin of error is very small and maybe our margin of error is larger but there's still a margin of error that is a space where agency can happen and so they. So the projection numerologist in the operating room makes bad judgment, mm-hmm. and 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 consequences come from that. And so, um, uh, Isa or uh, didn't want that. He wanted a different decision, and and it would have pushed it. But either one of them are fallible human beings, and so their precise science is is. In, in the general is all about probabilities, not about exactness. And I think that's why a lot of people are frustrated with scientific truth because it's a, you, you want truth to be absolute. And so there's there's a lot going on in in that scene, scene for me, you know, where um, it has has to do with agency and control and and uh, personal arrogance about your abilities to control your own future. And yeah. I, I'm happy about how rich that feels to me now. Yeah, so it's very provocative. It is. It's, um, it invites engagement with it because it is such a fascinating, prop- fascinating proposition. Uh, and then you push it even further. You push it toward um, toward churchy stuff, Mormonism. I never want to call it anymore. Um, but there's this uh, concept in it called psi, and you write it with the Greek letter psi. Um, and the the way it's talked about sometimes, um, I think uh, it's defined at one point as the essential manner of intelligence, which has kind of a Joseph Smith feel to it. Uh, and then later, um, some things happen, uh, some things are said about psi, and and people, you know, bringing their intelligence and their energy to try and change the course of things as the history of this universe unfolds. And I wonder how analogous it is to something like prayer or faith or bringing the, the, 
the will and and in particular the goodwill of people together to try to affect yeah. what we have to choose from. The more I learn about God, the more I think that uh, God, mother and father, and uh, extended, however it, it it is extended, that they they love agency. They love that people can make a choice and become responsible for those choices. And I, to me, that's the core of the, of the gospel. And so if you, um, yeah, if, um, anyway, that's, I really believe that strongly. I don't know what I, I'm not, I'm not sure what else I would say about that, but, um, yeah. It was just, it was just nice. <laughs> oh, and I, I know what I was going to say is is agencies. I'm sorry, intelligences. That was a kind of Freudian slip there because I think that there's some something that 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 the cultivation of something, intelligence as a force in the universe, and I I I don't exactly mean priesthood, although maybe in the 19th century sense that women thought. I am a queen. I am. I have priesthoods. You know that that all of us, everyone does not not as something that only men have. That's not the way I'm thinking about it. But, but some of us still think that way. <laughs> right, right, and and that I mean that I guess I'm a 19th century person in the, in that respect. That that everyone has this ability to think and create and. Uh, in, enact something in the universe through their will, and that that power of creation is marvelous and dangerous. And if you try to restrict someone's agency, you're doing the work of the devil. You know that I really believe that. That's the answer, yeah. So I end with this moment where Isa is considering all the things that he can't offer his family the things he can't change for them in the uh the course they seem to be on uh and he's just a remarkable scientist he's cured cancer in the past and as he stands looking at this newborn uh, granddaughter he thinks to himself that his success curing cancer seemed merely ironic at this one point another good moment out uh, for me do you have anything to add about that? I just want to hear you talk about all these great lines you wrote. Well, he he would trade anything for this child at that point, you know. And um, this was before my newest grandchild was born, but she is uh, living with us. Uh, her mother and father moved from Florida back to here and are, to get new jobs and 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 start and come back to Utah and. And she's one year old, and she's so curious. And, um, I mean, speaking of an intelligence that is having volition, if she wants this, sometimes she can't have it, but pretty much her mother and I, any, any caregiver she has, is really focused on letting her explore as much as she can without getting too much hurt, you know, that, that she has a lot of choices, which marker to use and all of these things, you know, and, and, uh, just watching her awe at the universe when what she does will shape her mind and how many opportunities she has to make choices will shape her mind. And it, and it just, just reinforces for me how important that is that, I mean, Isa would take control and make things go differently if he could. And uh, in maybe that's a tragic idea. Uh, and it's impossible. You cannot make the universe conform to your wish precisely. But you can allow others to have this glorious exploration of the universe. And where would it ever be enough? You think that someone who had cured cancer would be satisfied with his contribution to making the world better for everybody and 
Yeah. But there's this child. A yeah. child so precious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the child and and by extension her parents and yeah. his wife never even has is going to meet this child. All of it is kind of this this uh bundle of of agency and destiny and personality all together. Uh, and, and that was a fascinating part of the story, too. Um, just in, you know, reading philosophy, because I'm an academic, too, when uh, the word essential comes up, sometimes for me it emphasizes how people are separate. It's kind of like an old uh, Aristotelian concept of individuality. Uh, and there is kind of the argument for agency can, contains an argument for individuality in it. Uh, but this one also, especially as it the story wraps up, seems to be focusing on uh, agency in the in the search for others, for connection to things that are lost, to people who are lost. So this idea of the essential as being separate, all of a sudden what is essential is, is the connection, is that things come together. It's just a really satisfying resolution of the story for me. Like, is it is it that philosophical for you or was it just more... No, I, think it's, I, I don't think it is. I think it's pretty basic, you know, for me that that uh, the, that he loves this his daughter-in-law because because she's con- engaged with him in a way no one else has and because his son loves her and so so for him the connection is not a very philosophical one it's very kinetic very in his being and i don't mean that there aren't the philosophical implications that you suggested but mm-hmm. for me that core uh, relationship is is uh, pretty pretty valuable i have there's one philosophical connection for me that that it is in in uh Le- Le- levinas talks about the the image of the guest coming into the home and that that entertainment of the other in your own space is always fraught and dangerous and vital and essential. And Isa has felt that with this unexpected young woman and in an expected way with his own wife and his, his own son. But he, he is, despite his uh, importance and his self-importance and his expertise, at core, he's a father and a husband, and and he uh, would do anything for these people that he loves. I think. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be written in um, by yourself to be philosophical, but and that was that was how I experienced. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah right, exactly. The it really important part of it. It's not like a. A doting fatherly love story by any means. Um, and the fact that it's the daughter-in-law who is the epicenter of this kind of burst of love that he has rather than the other people in the family that it could have been. That was uh, an interesting choice, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, appreciate you know, I don't know what to think about that. Um, my... In the families of my children, we've had a lot of divorces, and mm-hmm. and the 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 people that my two son, three three of my sons are uh, with right now are very good for them, and their previous partners were good for them too, but. But uh, I, 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 I don't really have a line on that. I, I, these, uh, I, I don't have a way of talking about th- that. It's, it's surprising to me too, and unexpected. But authentic too. It doesn't seem like 
a ridiculous proposition that this kind of relationship could exist and could have this kind of effect on someone. It's, it's yeah. well done. Well, um, I yeah, so um, can you tell me what you are working on? If you're not writing this, the rest of this novel for me, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what are, what's going on for you in in the rest of your uh, retirement career? Well, I'm um, been working on. I mean, I have a uh, a new novel that's uh, in part about climate change, but all of my novels and my short stories, I think, are are maybe not the short stories so much, but are about this connection to other people that we've been talking about. You know, a community. I really uh, am engaged with the idea of community. Um, my department chair and I were at a conference, Lance Larson, and he's, uh, I, he's, somebody asked what his poetry was about, and I said, Lance, your poetry is about uh, what it means to have a body. And he said, oh. And then I said, well, what's mine? And he said, oh, everything you write is about community. And that's true. And this Ruth at the end of the earth is about a woman who's um, a teacher. The latest novel, Ruth at the End of the World. The latest published novel is okay. is okay. Um, set in the Great Basin in 2135, so not quite 100 years, well, a little more than 100 years from now. And she is a woman who has taught people how to survive in the desert. And her an ancestry is primarily Goshute, but also a Mormon rancher and... Um, it, she's a, a, a mongrel of, of sorts, but people have come to the desert to live when they couldn't live in their homelands, such as in uh, Central America or, you know, equ equatorial countries. They've moved to the desert, and there's just as much rain as there is now, but it doesn't ever make snow, so there can't be ranching and farming under the paradigm that we have, where water goes into a reservoir and then you take it out bit by bit. The water just soaks into the ground, so there's no more agriculture in the way it has been. And so they've come here to live off of insects, and she's one who trained them how to live in the desert. And then there's been a long drought now for seven years, and so they're up against the danger of losing everything. You know, the, the, the humanity in this area of the world will just die. And someone comes from a city, which is a walled city and excludes all these other people. And they live by using a lot of atomic energy and hydroponics. And, you know, so it's all a selfish organization. And, and she's much more about helping people uh, accommodate themselves to the, this new world. And so th these two have an encounter that is a little bit of a debate about community for me. What, what, what does it mean to open yourself to the other uh, when, and and we're going to face this decision as as a country and the world because there will be some countries that will be under underwater. What do we do with those people? Do we welcome them in? Uh, Canada is much more welcoming than the U.S. is in many ways, and and so you know where will they go? You know, and and how will will cities? exclude them, you know, what will happen? That's very interesting to me. What will happen when the environment gets more difficult to live in? How will people respond to that in terms of thinking about the other? And that's what that no novel does for me. Right now I'm working on, oh, go ahead. Received. Oh, sorry, I'm talking over here. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was you go, going to talk about something else. But I'm oh, Okay, well, can we talk about climate fiction for just a second? Yeah. Uh, how is it received like, in the community uh, that you live in? I um, I don't sell enough books to, to that, that there's much of a splash anywhere. My daughter teases me. And she said, uh, Dad, you write about depressed Mormons in the desert. And he said, those are three subjects that are just not sexy subjects, and so <laughs> she's right. You know, I don't, I don't have a ton of readers, but, but I do appreciate people who buy my books. But I don't, I don't know that it's done any earth, earth shaking thing for you know. I, I, um, 
the best thing that would happen is that someone would dislike it and try to get it banned, then I'd be all right, you know. So that's how you we made it, yeah, for sure. But that won't happen either. So no, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, please go on. What were you going to tell me about after the climate change? Well, I'm working on a series of essays, and I've been working. This is my longest term project. Uh, you know, uh, like. 30 years I've been working on these essays about my rat, my family who's had five generations of ranchers in uh, Rush Valley, which is on the eastern edge of the Great Basin. And so my great-great-grandfather brought his cow. the Great Basin is? I don't know what the Great Basin is. It's, um, it's a, an area encompassing western Utah, Nevada, and eastern California and up into southern Idaho and uh, n northern Arizona a little bit, but it's uh, an area where there's basin and range. So there's uh, a, a range of mountains and then a basin, another range of mountains and another basin. There's a, a journalistic writer who compared it to stretch marks on a, a woman that, that it's or you know whoever that that's that's oh, okay. what yeah I got the image like pretty much perfectly now <laughs> yeah well he was in oh what is his name anyway uh, but but so so that's uh, it's arid high uh, challenging to live in and mm -hmm. uh, so but our my family of uh, Mormon ancestry has lived in that area and so it's about environment or landscape and family and uh, religion or faith, you know, that uh, have shaped, has shaped their lives and and each generation has fa fa faced new challenges. And so that's that's what the essays are about. Hmm. So is it personal essays about your own family? And yeah, they're, they're personal slash historical. So they might be about a subject, but I engage with the subject in a way a historian wouldn't. You know, I engage with the family members and talk about my relationships to them. So it really is personal and historical essays. Yeah. And so can we, is there a release date for that? So we should be watching for it? Oh, I wish. Um, I, I'm going to have it ready this uh, late spring or summer to send. To, there's a publisher interested in it, and I hope to send it to them, you know, uh, in three or four months. But that's what I've been doing. Nice, nice. Uh, do you miss working, teaching, writing? Um, I really, really like students. I like teaching, but I, I haven't missed it. <laughs> you know, the, there's I get enough uh, experience. You know, I have I'm in a writing group, and I, I get enough chance to inter, uh, interact with people and talk about writing and so forth and. But but uh, I don't miss grading, um, which is seems just counter counterproductive in terms of writing because it changes people from trying to figure out how to get better to trying to figure out how to get a good grade, and they yeah. split that in their mind and it just it wrecks it. So grading and all of the committee work and all of the uh, stuff that it takes to maintain the inflated balloon of an institution. <laughs> Yes, uh, I'm. I'm not tired. I don't miss that at all. But I do miss students, and uh, yeah. All right. I, I bet you do. Yeah. Uh, well, anything you want to send us off with before we wrap up here? Hey. See if our elegant way to get us to the end. I don't know. I was. Uh, I've been over the holiday. I read the journals of my great grandfather and it's and he had two sons die one was uh killed in per, at pearl harbor no oh, land wow. and the other one his youngest son was killed by a burst of append appendix and the way he wrote about them reminded me of Isa, because he dearly loved them, mm -hmm. and uh, his sorrowing went on for a good while in his journal, and it just, uh, he, 
if he could have traded places with those, and that's not exactly what ISA tries to do, but if he could have traded places with either one of those, he would have done it in a second, you know, and, and that, but that, that it, it feels like he appreciated their potential and part of, I mean, he knew because he had a lot of faith that he would see them again, but their potential was cut short, you know, and so that thing that we were talking about a while ago of do we do this or this? They had no more option to do that, you know, in this life anyway. And and uh, he he really sorrowed over the over that. I think the loss of potential in his two sons uh, what affected him more than probably anything. Although I mean, he he loved he was despairing that they couldn't come see him anymore. But you know, so anyway, I. I don't know that that's a really good send off, but that's what I have. Well, this is, I would say that this is certainly Mormon fiction that you've written here, but when it comes time for the characters to wonder where the people they've lost have gone, um, the story doesn't answer that. Um, you know, there's no uh, funeral talk of the plan of salvation in here, yeah. to it's right. over. I personally have been criticized for not including that kind of stuff in my own fiction on death. Um, that is the reason why some people go to any fiction about death, is to hear that uh, and have it take on the guise of, of universal knowledge in an alternate universe. Um, but it, but you, you withheld that. You didn't have the characters uh, come to it. What do you need to say about that choice like was it tempting to to do the funeral talk in here i don't feel like it's it needs it personally but is it automatic to go to that well i i think that we um we do we don't know exactly where people are who have departed i mean people have a kind of um assumption about it that that how is it going to happen exactly? You know, we don't we don't really know, and and death is is a is so final, and uh, I just think that that uh, we we often are complacent in our assumptions and don't interrogate them en enough, and I think that. Uh, that that this story could help to undo a little complac complacency about that. But even more than that, the story is, in one respect, autobiographical, that we did, Carla and I did have a stillborn child. And, and what Carla felt at that time really powerfully is, I don't, I don't know where that child has gone. You know, I, we had people in the ward who um, told told us horrible things. <laughs> like one man said, I have received inspiration for you that uh, your child is going to be reincarnated as your next child. And, you know, Carla did not need to hear that baloney. You know, it was horrible that he said that. But he knew, you know, he, he was so complacent that he knew there was a, a perfect easy answer to her sorrow and there was no perfect easy answer she didn't know where her child had gone our child and that that was frightening and so i think that if, I've, if we can undo a little complacency that's all right for a fiction writer great ending thank you so much Beyond the Block, part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, is a weekly Come Follow Me podcast that centers the marginalized in Mormonism. Join Brother Jones and Brother Knox, a Black Lifelong member and a queer convert theologian, respectively, as they read the scriptures through the lenses of their identities and others in an effort to bring the culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints 
closer and more in line with its theology, which centers Christ's justice and compassion. New episodes every Monday. Dialogue Podcast Network.